Demonology, tape number five. Thank you for choosing to listen to a Sword of the Lord audio cassette tape. The lesson that you're about to hear is entitled The Expulsion of Demons from the Human Body, Part 2, by Dr. Curtis Hudson. This lesson was recorded on June 2nd, 1974, at Forest Hills Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia. And now, Dr. Curtis Hudson. And as I reminded you last week, I remind you again now, I'm really a little bit hesitant to even teach this particular lesson, because most of you will never need it anyway, uh, the big majority of you. And uh, if you're a born-again believer, you'll never be demon-possessed. You may be strongly demon-influenced. So I should really spend my time talking about demon influence, which I hope to do if I don't get to it this morning, uh, perhaps next Sunday morning and two or three Sunday mornings about what to do whenever Satan makes suggestions to you and uh, how to uh, reject the evil thoughts or that Satan may give to you, and he does give evil thoughts. He filled Ananias' heart to lie to God, according to Acts chapter 5, and uh, he often fills our hearts or minds. But anyway, I'll share this with you. First, in preparing to cast out demons, not preparing for an exorcism, because you'll never have one, hopefully. Now, if you stay around here, I'll teach you against performing an exorcism. But you could cast out demons. You have the right, if you're a believer, and the power and the authority to do so. No unsaved person should ever attempt it because the demons want to go into something else or someone else. Uh, so the unsaved person would be in danger, of course. Mark chapter 5, you remember the demon-possessed man of Gadara? Uh, that the demons who said they were legion, which means there were probably 3,000 to 6,000 of them in the one man, requested they may go into a herd of swine feeding nearby. Jesus gave them leave, and they went into the herd of swine. The herd of swine ran into a sea and, and were choked. Secondly, when uh, ever casting out of demons is attempted, make sure every unsaved person and every person not right with Christ is out of the room. Uh, I say that for the same reason that no unsaved person should attempt it. If unsaved people are in the room, the demon wants to go into, into someone else or an animal or anything nearby. In fact, I've read two cases this week where uh, demons supposedly went into animals, and, both, and in both cases they were cats, which is very unusual. I heard Oliver Green, Dr. Oliver B. Green, that you hear on the radio tell of uh, dealing with a person who was evidently, he said, demon-possessed, and when they dealt with and prayed for and, and the demons left the person, they went into a cat in the room and the cat went wild and ran through a screen door. Uh, you may have heard him tell that story. Also read another story this week where they prayed for a man that, uh, that had cancer. Uh, he was healed, and that's not to say everybody has cancer, demon possessed, not by any means, but in this case, this man did have cancer. They prayed, he was immediately healed, according to the testimony I read, and a cat in the room went wild. Uh, that's very interesting because uh, uh, the Church of Satan, you have one here in Atlanta, um, has a statement something like this, cats and dogs make good sacrifices. The only thing better than cats and dogs is infants. And that's rather frightening, isn't it? And they claim to have 2,000 members here in the city of Atlanta. Um, somebody, I'm, I'm receiving more articles people are reading and sending to me and cutting out of papers and it's uh, very interesting. Not only make sure every unsaved person is out of the room, but every person not right with God. In other words, if you've given ground to Satan in any area of your life, Ephesians 4.27 says, uh, give no place to the devil. Don't give him ground. Don't give him room. You give him room when you willingly, uh, knowingly do something evil, such as reading some... Uh, Literature, uh, would call it literature, uh, some trash, uh, trashy books, going to uh, what I'd call dirty movies. They're called X-rated movies now. X marks the spot, you know. Uh, spot you ought not to be. You give ground to him when you yield in any area. Allow yourself to be tempted. The Bible says, uh, shun the very appearance of, e of evil. Second Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lust. The only thing to do is turn your back. Run. Flee it, as Joseph did in the Old Testament. When you open yourself up for Satan, like by reading anything uh, that would be sinful or wrong, going to X-rated movies, uh, what you're doing is giving Satan room in your life. And the Bible said don't do that. If you've given Satan room by, by let's say, by losing your temper, let's say you have a bad temper and, you, and you're prone to... Uh, 
fly off the handle, lose your temper, and you and you do it without any resistance. Whenever you feel the urge, you just satisfy yourself, and it's just a, you just you know have your say and scream and yell and carry on. You've given place to Satan in your life. So if you're not right with Christ, I would suggest you not even be in the room. Um, I gave you the verse in James chapter four, verse seven, where it says, uh, "Submit yourselves to God." Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Then the next verse says, res, uh, draw nigh unto God. Just before it says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you, it says, submit yourselves to God. Just after it says, resist the devil, he'll flee from you, it says, uh, draw nigh to God. Submit yourselves to God, draw nigh to God. You ought to be as close to God as you can if you ever attempt anything like this. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but if you were to attempt something like it, I'd, I'd make sure every known sin in my life was completely confessed. I'd uh, make sure that every sin was gone and I was thoroughly and completely right with Christ before I ever attempted anything like this. Third thing I said is no woman should ever attempt it. Demons are masculine. You know, I've read stories, had some experiences, and I, I have never known whenever demons were commanded to give their names. I have never known a demon yet to give the name of a woman. It's always the name of a man. If you know of anybody that's ever dealt... Uh, with trying to cast out demons, and they have uh, contacted demons within a person and conversed with them. Uh, if you know of somebody that has been given the name of a woman when, at, when, when they commanded the demon to give his name, uh, I'd like you to tell me about it, because I don't know of a single case. Of the cases I've read, the demons always give a male name. I said that because angels are always masculine in the Bible, never feminine, and uh, demons are fallen angels. They're called the angels of Satan in Matthew chapter 25, where it says, Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. So I would say no woman should ever attempt it at all. Fourth thing is, the person they're attempting should be completely surrendered to Christ. Uh, if there's any doubt about whether or not you're completely yielded, your, your life ought to be completely yielded to Christ, because the only power you have is the power of the Holy Spirit. First John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You don't have any right, any power over Satan, and he knows that. And if you think you do have any right, any power over him, then you go to resist him. Do battle with him. You'll find out real quick that he's not, he's not at all afraid of you. Now, the third thing I'd cover this morning is, is the probing, or the questioning. Suppose somebody comes to you and they, they think they're demon-possessed, or suppose somebody brings someone to you whom they think is demon-possessed. You need to determine that. It's not easy. Because you, you'd hate to look a fellow in the eye and say, I think you're demon-possessed, and I'm going to find out, you know. Uh, in some cases, a person will admit that they think they're demon-possessed, and they'll come to you. And I don't suggest that you go up down the street and look for people that you think may be demon-possessed and walk up to them and grab them and say, I think you've got a demon. Uh, the bad thing about teaching something like this is that people go off on tangents. I know people whose names I could call that you wouldn't be with them two minutes before they'd detect a demon in you. Uh, they'll tell you that quick. They'll look you in the eye and say, you've got a demon of pride. Uh, they'll look you in the eye and say, you've got a demon of laziness. Uh, you've got a demon of lust. Uh, you've got a demon of greed. And boy, they, you know, right quick. Now, they, they're fanatical. They've gone off. I've even been around some. I don't look at them because I'm afraid they'll tell me how many demons are in me and, and what kind they are. But there's some people who are like that. You couldn't get in the car with them. These are people who have had contact with demons within people. And they've got so excited about dealing with demons that they've forgotten that there's a Bible that says anything else at all. And they've become experts in demonology, and, and they just look at people and pick out the demons, tell them what kind of demon it is, and so on. A lot of times, sell the person on the idea that he is demon-possessed. But if you're a believer, you can never be demon-possessed. My reason for that is that the Holy Spirit and the demon spirit would not inhabit the same tabernacle. And the Holy Spirit came into you to take up his permanent residence the day you were saved. So when I talk about doing the probing, you have to be very tactful. Uh, first of all, I'd say only one do the probing. By the way, I don't think I would ever deal with someone that I thought was even possessed. You may want to make a note of this. Unless I had another good Christian with me, I just don't think I'd want to be alone with a person by myself for various reasons. No telling what the demons are liable to accuse you of later through the person if you're unsuccessful. And uh, you have a reputation at stake. If you're a good Christian, you want to keep that reputation. So I'd always have another good Christian with me. I wouldn't have too many. I'd like to have one or two, at least one, I think. I don't have any Bible verse for that, except that's my own uh, opinion about it. So I'll give you a Bible verse. And only, once you start, only one should do the probe. In other words, if, if we're dealing with a person, I should not ask one question, you ask another one, and I ask one, the person's back and forth. It's all like witnessing a soul wedding. When one starts getting the plan of salvation, 
And the other one should back away and uh, begin praying. And pray for that one that's doing the probing, trying to determine whether or not the person is demon-possessed. Uh, you'll want to be very tactful about it uh, personally. And, and I hate to give you too much about uh, myself in regards to this, but I don't know uh, any other way to share it with you. Personally, I would start off by trying to make sure or determine for sure whether or not the person was saved. And I'd, uh, I would not take that for granted. If they said, uh, I'm saved, or I am not saved, uh, I, would, I wouldn't pay much attention to that at all. I would proceed as if I thought they were unsaved and begin to witness to them, giving them the plan of salvation, uh, getting a definite yes or no answer on several questions. I'd get a... You could tactfully approach it in this way. You could say, for instance, do you, do you really believe that you are a sinner? Answer me yes or no. And uh, they could say, uh, yes. Secondly, do you believe that uh, as a sinner you owe a penalty? You could quote the Bible verses, Romans 6, 23, Ezekiel 18 and 4, uh, James 1, 15, and so on. The wages of sin is death. That's the second death, the lake of fire. Do you believe that? Yes, I believe that. Then you could tactfully lead up to the question you want to really address to the spirit within the person, and that is, do you confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? You could say something like this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? died on a cross to overcome Satan and to pay your sin debt, uh, when you get there, you'll probably get a little static. The person will quit saying yes or no. Uh, they may become very nervous. I talked with a man this week who's a missionary, and he's, uh, we were talking about this subject. He said, I know a man when I... He's, he's home on furlough now. He said, I know a man when I go back. I know exactly what's wrong with that man, but I didn't know until you and I had been discussing this subject. So he said, now I know. He said, every time I mention the name Jesus, or that Jesus has come in the flesh to that man, it says his teeth begin to chatter as if he is having a, 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 a chill. It says his teeth just go, mm, and he chatters and chatters and chatters. And uh, he said, it's, it's weird. And uh, he said, if I don't talk about Jesus or ask him to confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, that I don't have any problem. But when I ask him to confess that Jesus has come in the flesh, he said his teeth begin to chatter. And... Uh, he said, I know what's wrong with him, and when I go back, he said, I'll know exactly how to deal with him. So in the probing, only one should do the probing. Uh, I, like I say, first I'd deal with a matter of salvation. I would assure myself that the person was saved on the basis of what the Bible says. And I'm taking for granted here that you know how to present the plan of salvation clearly and that you know how to determine whether or not a person is genuinely saved. I'll give you just a little here. If he says, yes, I know if I die, I'll go to heaven, ask him why he knows he'll go to heaven. If his answer is anything other than something like this, I believe that I'm a sinner and Jesus Christ died on the cross. He paid my sin debt. And I go to heaven on the basis of the payment made. If Jesus Christ died for me. Then uh, he's probably not saved. If he says, well, I know I'm going to heaven because I joined the church, then he's trusting his church membership for salvation. And you know, if he trusts his church membership of salvation, he's lost. Because Jesus said, He that believeth not on the Son is condemned already, John 3, 18, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. If he says, I've kept the Ten Commandments, or I've been baptized, or I'm trying to live the best I know how, or I turned over a new leaf, these are all wrong answers. The answer is, Jesus Christ paid my sin debt, and I go to heaven on the basis of what he did. Now, they might use that same terminology, but that's what they'll say. A good question to ask the demon when you contact him is, do you confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? I have been told by people who are very close to me who have who've contacted demons within people that demons always say no. They'll never say yes. And I have biblical grounds for this. If you want to make a note of it, it's 1 John chapter 4, the first few verses. It says, Beloved, try every spirit, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not is of the Antichrist. Uh, your question should be phrased something like this. When it's obvious to you that the demon is manifesting himself, like for instance, let's take the man on the mission field the missionary told me about this week. Let's say when he starts talking about Jesus and that man's mouth begins to, to, uh, to shake as if he's having a cold chill and his teeth are beginning to chatter, you know immediately that that demon is is uh, manifesting himself in that person by that person's reaction. When he starts that, you could then address yourself to the demon. And here's the wording you'd want to use. Spirit now manifesting, do you confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh? Wait for an answer. Do you get no answer? 
do it again with authority. Not with your authority, but with the authority of Christ. You may come back like this. Spirit now manifesting, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to confess whether or not Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. If the person is silent, and sometimes a, a voice will try to come, and it won't come. But many times, immediately, if you are right with Christ, and you're depending upon Christ and the authority of God, immediately you'll get an answer. No. 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 And that has happened over and over and over again. It's happened to uh, several people in this church who've had that experience. It's happened to me personally in dealing with people. And uh, they'll never say yes. Uh, it may be, sometimes a person may say yes, and then another voice say no. Usually, though, you'll get an answer yes or no. If you keep getting a yes, 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 as you address yourself, make sure. In other words, don't, don't argue with the demon. If you contact the demon, don't argue with him. Don't give him any loopholes. Command him in the name of Jesus that he gives you, uh, uh, makes a confession. Do you confess? In the, in the name of Jesus, I command you to confess whether or not Jesus has come in the flesh. Now, they'll say no, because when Jesus came in the flesh, it was in the flesh, on the cross, that Jesus Christ bruised the head of the serpent. And it's, that's where he gained the victory. Now, this may sound a little weird to you. Uh, just, I don't know whether it does or not, but uh, it's very biblical. You say, where? Well, I, listen, I've been reading accounts where Jesus contacted demons, the demons conversed with him, said, let us go into these swine, and Jesus gave them leave and went into the swine. Somebody said, why would Jesus allow those demons to go on those 2,000 swine, they go into the sea and choke themselves. I suppose the reason was that that was an illegitimate business anyway for those Jews to be carrying on. They were not supposed to be uh, raising pigs and selling them and selling hard meat. They, it was against their law to do that. And so Jesus figured he'd put them out of the illegitimate business at the same time. And so he made uh, several thousand pounds of deviled ham real quick. They'll always say no. Once you contact the demon, still on the subject of the probing, once you contact the demon and get the answer no, I'd ask, I'd ask it several times, get a no several times. Then you'll want to try to find out the demon's name. The person may be possessed by several demons. If so, you want to get the name of every demon and deal with them by name one by one. Uh, now, again, that's my own idea about that. You may want to try to deal with all of them at one time. I don't know. But uh, if a person is possessed by many, as this man was in the book of Mark, chapter 5, where he was possessed by at least 2,000 demons, I think between three and 6,000, because he answered, my name is Legion, not the man, but the spirit within the man. If you read Mark carefully, you'll see it. Jesus did not address that to the man, but the demons within the man. And he said, my name is Legion because we are many. I think he was possessed by as many as three to six thousand demons. That's, that's almost unbelievable. It's a, it's a Bible account, so of course I believe it without any trouble at all. Uh, but I would, uh, once the demon said no, I'd just come back with a question after I got several no's and say, Spirit now manifesting, I command you in the name of Jesus to give me your name. No name come, uh, just get firm with it. Don't feel your own sufficiency, feel your own insufficiency, but feel the sufficiency of Christ Know that and claim the promise, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You may want to quote that to the demon. You may want to say, I have no power over you, demon, but Jesus does. And the Bible said, greater is he that's in me and he that's in the world. Not in my authority, but in the authority of Jesus Christ. I command you to give me your name. It's what I would call wrestling with them, because sometimes they won't. And you'd have to argue, not argue with them, but just, uh, just be persistent. I, you're going to give me your name. I command you in Jesus' name. And you'll get his name if you contact the demon. In most cases. Uh, if you don't, maybe you give up too quick. I have known people sort of, uh, especially since I've been teaching, I've had a lot of people call me and ask me questions, and a lot of articles have been sent to me, and people have come tell me various experiences they've had. Um, there is a person who's uh, sought it, uh, advice from me, and, and I've just asked questions and found what's happened is, and this person has contacted demons within a person, and I have no doubts about that, uh, from the conversation, with the questions I asked, with the answers he gave, but he has not yet come to the place where he's asked the demons to leave. He's only, asked, he's only rebuked the demons, like when the person would go to have something similar to a convulsion. Uh, he would rebuke the demon in Jesus' name. He'd say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you. And the demon would quit manifesting himself through a convulsion, and, and the person would be calm. 
or the person would go into a room, wouldn't come out, and several people couldn't drag the person out, which shows the extraordinary strength of the person. And he had rebuked the demon, I rebuke you in Jesus' name, leave this person alone. And, and was successful in rebuking it, and, and, the, and the person would get quiet and calm. But he never attempted to cast the demon out, just to control the demon by the power of Christ. Do you see the difference? Uh, you could control a person, control a person who's had a lot of problems, uh, and they may be calm, but you're going to have to try to get the demon out of the person. The person may be possessed by several, if so, you want to get the name of every one of them, deal with them one by one. Demons always give male names, as I mentioned before. I've never known a case where a demon answered and gave a female name. If I did, I'd doubt the fact the person was demon possessed. I would think the devil's trying to play a trick on me or else the demon was lying to me. And they will lie to you. They will lie to you if you have any... I, I, I don't want to talk about feelings too much, but you'll, you'll sort of... You, you know, when you look at a person in the eye, you can tell whether or not they're sincere. Because the devil's awful tricky. He's very subtle. And sometimes he'll lie to you. If you think he's lying, just say, I command you in Jesus' name not to lie to me. But you give me your name. and In Jesus' name, I command you, don't lie to me. And you'll get the right name. I never don't want to give a female name. If I did, I would question it. Next thing under probing, once you contact the demon, never reason with a demon. Never reason with him. Uh, he may say, and uh, they have said, where will I go? You know, like he said to Jesus. You know, can we go in this herd of swine? Uh, you never want to reason with them. There's a very interesting verse, and we won't ask you to turn to it, but just make a note of it if you want to. In Mark chapter 5, for the demon-possessed man of Gadara was dealt with. And the Bible said that he had often been bound with chains and fetters, and they would not hold him, he would break them asunder. But there's a little expression that says, no man could tame him, which is very interesting. No man could tame him. You couldn't tame him with love. You can't tame him with uh, arguments and with reasoning. You just can't tame him. So there's no use to reason with him. Never reason with the demon. I'm talking about the person. You have to, when you, if you ever have an experience, which I... I hope you never do. And I'm not teaching this. You go out and have experiences. And if you go out hunting up demon-possessed people, I will have failed in this because I'm only teaching this because we're teaching demonology. And I promised that I would cover this particular area. I'd much rather deal with demon influence instead of demon possession. And I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I just want that point to be made. Never reason with a demon. In Mark 5, it was said that the demon-possessed man, no man could tame him. You can't reason with him in love. Never argue with a demon or give him loopholes, places to go, things to do. Just stick with your gun, so to speak. Um, when you command the demon to leave, you also want to command him to go back to the pit or the abyss. Remember what the demon said to Jesus? Uh, it said, don't, uh, don't cast us into the pit. Or, that's not the exact words, but words similar to that. Yeah, don't send us into the deep. That was the word. And the marginal rendering is the abyss. Don't send us into the deep or the abyss. The implication seems to be that the devils themselves who possessed the man knew that it was the practice of Jesus to send them into the deep or consign them to the pit or the abyss. Uh, if you ever attempt it, you want to be sure that you consign the demon to the pit or the abyss. He may say, I don't want to go, you know. But you may, you, you'd have to come back again in the authority of Jesus. You have to go. If you cast the demon out, I'd also command him never to come back to that person. I'd also command him to leave and never come back to this person, never bother this person again. I consign you to the pit, the abyss, in the name of Jesus, in the authority of Jesus. I, I consign you to the pit. Uh, I've never had this experience, but I've had others to say this, that, that it has been that when demons left people, you could actually hear them scream as if they were going into a pit. Just, oh, they're going deep. And out of sight. I have never, not out of sight because I never, never did see them, uh, out of hearing. Uh, I've never had that happen, but I've had people tell me that happened. I don't know. I don't have a Bible account where that happened. Don't give them loopholes. Next thing I'd say is the power, the power for casting out demons. And let's turn uh, to Mark chapter 16. Let me share with you a few verses under this. We'll conclude our lesson this morning. I, I want to finish this because there's something that ought to be done once the demons are cast out of a person. Something ought to be done. Mark chapter 16, verse 17, if you have your Bible. Mark 16, verse 17, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. Underline that in my name. In my name. 
When you say in the name of Jesus, remember, that's not a hocus-pocus magical expression. What you're saying is in the authority of Jesus. The trouble with those traveling professional exorcists in Acts chapter 19 is they thought there was some magical power just in saying the name of Jesus over this demon-possessed man. So they said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we adjure you to come out. And the demon answered back out of the man and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man charged him and beat the daylights out of seven men, left them wounded and naked. Now, there's no magical power just in saying the name of Jesus. And I think too many times we use that name too lightly, even at the close of our prayers. It, it becomes a habit to say we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And you don't even know what you mean when you say that. What you mean is in the authority and the power of Jesus. Not in my power, but in his power. And if you're not a Christian, you couldn't say in the power of Jesus because Jesus doesn't indwell you in the person of the Holy Spirit. So they were cast out by the power of the name of Jesus. Luke chapter 10. Turn Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Be the next book over. Luke chapter 10. And this time in verse 17. Luke 10, verse 17. And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, demons, are subject unto us through thy name. You see that? They are subject to us through thy name. And then Jesus cast them out with his own word. With his own word. Turn to Matthew, please. We'll read this one. Matthew chapter 8, if you have a Bible. This time verse 16. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Do you get that? Many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits, or demons, with his word, and healed all that were sick. You see, there's a, there's a distinction made between illness and demon possession, which is not to be confused. The Bible clearly makes a distinction between insanity and demon possession, between epilepsy and demon possession, between sickness and demon possession. Though so many times a demon-possessed person... Uh, uh, can be sick because of the possession. And I've uh, covered this when we talked about the marks of demon possession, where sometimes they were deaf because of it, sometimes they were blind because of it, but not all deaf people and all blind people are demon-possessed. But, but the demons did cause deafness, did cause blindness, uh, speechlessness, uh, curvature of the spine, uh, something similar to epilepsy, uh, and many other things as we've covered. I won't go back to it. So that Jesus cast them out by his word. Matthew 12, 28, they're to be cast out by the Spirit of God. While you're in Matthew, turn over a couple of pages. Maybe I'll get to the end of this and at least get ready to build up for the next Sunday lesson here. Matthew 12, verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, that's Jesus talking, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So he cast out devils or demons by the Spirit of God. We're talking about the power to cast them out. They were subject to the disciples in Jesus' name. Jesus cast them out by his word, and the disciples cast them out by the Spirit of God. Now, real quickly, I don't know if you can write this down or not, because it is time to quit. Christ's disciples cast out demons in the name of Jesus. I'll give you two references. And this suggestion here, Submit yourself to the Holy Spirit's control verbally. I mean by that, you recognize the Holy Spirit indwells you as a believer. You don't think he does, you know he does, because the Bible says so. And the Holy Spirit's a person who wants to completely control your life. And you don't fool God, nor the Holy Spirit, by saying, all right, uh, I want to submit myself completely to the Holy Spirit's control, but in your mind you know you don't mean that. You know you mean it if the Holy Spirit asks you to do certain things, you'll do what he says. But if he asks you to sell your money or sell your property and take the money, go to the mission field or mission work or ask you to quit your uh, successful business and become a missionary yourself, you're not willing to do that, then you haven't submitted to the Holy Spirit's control. When you submit to his control, that means you'll do anything he wants you to do, anytime, any place, anywhere, no matter what people think about you. If you know that the Holy Spirit wants you to do it, you'll do it. And not many people make that kind of a surrender, but that's the kind of surrender I'm talking about. It's not the kind of surrender I'll do what you want me to do if I like what you want me to do. But it's the kind of surrender, I'll do what you want me to do regardless of what it is. All I want to do is, is get the orders and I'll obey them. Now, that's under the power. You wouldn't have power to cast out demons, I don't think, unless you had made such a surrender or submission of yourself to the Holy Spirit who indwells you. The person delivers, the fifth point I want to cover here under casting out demons. Immediately the person should be led to Christ. And secondly, 
the person should be given advice on how to resist the devil, which I'm going to cover next Sunday. But to show you why the person should be led to Christ, let's close the reading Luke 11, verse 24 through 26. These are two things ought to happen once demons are cast out of a person. Neither they should be led to Christ and the assurance of salvation all the way through. I'll talk about it next Sunday. And secondly, they should be given advice on how to resist the devil because the devil will come back. He'll come back. And Christians need this. I'm looking forward to teaching the next two or three lessons. I, if I had any way of making you come, I'd, I'd, I'd make it mandatory for you to be here for the next two lessons. I'd say you can't come back into the class if you don't get the next two. The next two is the most important for you as a Christian because you'll be faced more with the next two things I'm going to cover than anything else I have to cover. But let's turn to Luke chapter 11, verse... Uh, let me show you what happens when a person is not saved. Demons are cast out, but the person is not saved immediately afterwards. And you found it before I did because I was talking. You probably already read it now. Luke 11, verse 24 through verse 26. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, not the man, but the unclean spirit, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, that the unclean spirit says, I will return unto my house, do you see that? Remember what I said about demon possession? The difference between demon possession and demon influence is, is that the demon acts as the proprietor of the house, the owner. He comes and goes at will. This demon considers that man's body his house. Now, when you're demon influence, the demon does not consider your body as his territory or his own possession or his own uh, property. But he acts more like a guest who comes and goes, comes and goes. But when, in other words, he could never completely uh, possess the person in, in that he dominated the person's will and everything. That is a demon influence. Demon possession, he, he completely possesses, dominates the person, where the person cannot help himself at all. Demon influence is just suggestions and, and how, how much control he has over you is determined by how much you yield, but not so in demon possession. Here this demon left out of a man, walked in dry places, seeking rest, could not find any. The demon said, I will return to my house. He considered that man's body his own home and house. That's where I live. I'll return to my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. What had happened? The person had reformed. And you know what? 90% of Bible teaching, and Bible preaching in churches today is reformation for salvation. Clean up. Don't do this. Don't do that. Lay down this habit. I'm for living clean. Nobody is for living clean more than I am. But when you preach reformation for salvation, you're as modernistic as a man who doesn't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Here was a man who taught reformation. He cleaned up. He swept the house. He garnished it. He even started going to Sunday school. He even read his quarter straight from Nashville. He even started giving a little money to the church. The whole bit, he had it all. He swept and got And everybody in town would have thought he was a better Christian than the fundamentalist who was always fighting something. The only thing is the Holy Spirit hadn't come into that house. It was cleaned up, reformation, he swept and garnished it, and the man and the demon came back and found it swept and garnished. He didn't mind that at all. Next verse, Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and the last day of that man is worse than the first. The demon were cast out of a man, the man reformed, joined the church, went to Sunday school, read his quarterly cleaned up, the demon hunted rest, couldn't find any, went back to his house, found the fellow had not received Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit was not dwelling there, only he had reformed. The demon went back in and brought seven other demons more wicked than he was into the man, and the last state of the man was worse than the first. So when demons are commanded to leave, immediately, immediately the person should be led to Christ and given advice on how to resist the devil. And don't miss that lesson next Sunday, whatever you do, whatever you do, don't miss it. And don't leave... The morning service. One of the marks of demon possession is people go to Sunday school <laughs> and immediately after Sunday school they run off home to watch the ball game on TV and won't stay for the morning service. That's one of the main marks of demon possession. And uh, so I want you to watch people going out the door after Sunday school and if you can make any eye contact with them look them straight into the eye because the evil spirit always looks out of the man. You don't see the man by looking at his body. You have to look into his eye. You watch them close and they go out and watch your cars and things. Watch your pocketbooks. Because those kind of folks are dangerous. So it's not you going to go home, I know. Especially now. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father.
Give us a good service this morning. May all the folks stay. We want to build a great church. We want to help the folks to grow. I'm excited about the next two lessons coming up. I want to teach them so bad. I want to jump the gun this morning. Help our folks to know this is not a light subject here. It's something not to, it's not something to be dealt with lightly. Demons are for real. We don't want to become fanatical. We don't want to go overboard like some people walk around looking for demons. Everybody they see, they point at them and say, you've got a demon of pride, you've got a demon of this and demon of that. Don't do that. But if there are people who need help, they would be qualified to help them. In Jesus' name, amen. Please advance the tape to the end of side one before listening to side two.